So um, motor, the motor system and the sensory system can both be incredibly complex. I really want to try to simplify the motor system as much as possible. Um, so in the motor system, um, we really have sort of two major groups of neurons or motor neurons. Um, one of the major systems is a lateral cell group in the ventral columns of the spinal cord. Uh, that lateral cell group is called the dorsolateral cell group. Makes sense. Lateral cell group is dorsolateral. Medial group is called the ventromedial. So far, so good. So the reason why those are important is that they have different functions. The motor neurons of the dorsolateral cell group innervate distal musculature. So things like your toes, your fingers, your hands. Distal meaning far away from your trunk. So there's a specific set of motor neurons that innervate the distal musculature. That's the dorsolateral or lateral cell group. Motor neurons in the ventromedial cell group innervate the medial part of the body, that is the axial musculature, the trunk. So these two specific groups innervate different parts of the body. One innervates um, more dis distal musculature in the arms, hands, and fingers, for example. The uh, other uh, one innervates more of the midline body structures, the medial structures, the axial structures. So the motor neurons innervating the fingers are more dorsal, and those innervating the arms and shoulders are more ventral. The motor neurons from the ventromedial cell group, again, as I mentioned, innervate the axial musculature, the body midline. So that is kind of the, those are the two overall motor pathways that are important to be familiar with. Now the, these projections again can be divided into two major groups or systems. Again, sort of repeating myself, the lateral system connects with dorsolateral inner neurons and motor neurons and uh, largely responsible for limb movement. You can think of lateral limb. They both start with L. Uh, I make a lot of use of the, that type of way to remember things. Lateral system moves your limbs. The ventromedial system connects with ventromedial inner neurons and motor neurons, and it's largely concerned again with producing whole body movements or trunk movements. Um, within the lateral system, we have um, two um, independent systems one that's under the control of the cortex of the brain, and one that is under the control of the brainstem. And the same thing is true for the ventromedial system. We have one system uh, that originates in the cortex, so this uh, is largely under the control of the cortex of the brain, but the ventromedial system has three um, S um, systems or tracks that are under the control of the brainstem. So each of the two systems has at least one projection from the cortex and at least one from the brainstem. So there appears again in the motor system to be a dual control over movement. We've seen this in the sensory system that there are dual sensory pathways from the receptors to the brain in really all of the sensory systems. And we also have uh, multiple representations of pathways for the motor system. Uh, the lateral system, again, only has one cortical tract and one brainstem tract, the rubrospinal tract. The ventromedial system has one uh, cortical tract, again, and three brainstem tracts. So that, uh, I think, sort of largely gives you a picture of how the motor system is organized overall. Um, I would be pleased if you knew 
staff. Um, we will go on to talk a little bit more about what these individual tracks are responsible for. Um, this is just a diagram of the corticospinal motor tract going from the primary motor cortex um, with uh, pathways going through the internal capsule here in the basal ganglia and then down uh, near the junction of the medulla and the spinal cord those pathways cross over to the other side um, that's how we get the um, contralateral control of body movements So uh, in contrast with the um, corticospinal tract, the rubrospinal tract is the brainstem origin of the lateral system to innervate uh, musculature of the body. And uh, the rubrospinal tract gets its name from the origin. The rubro means red in Latin, so it's referring to the red nucleus. So the red nucleus of the midbrain sends its projection of the rubrospinal tract through the lateral system of the spinal cord. It originates in uh, a nucleus uh, called the magnocellular red nucleus, then crosses to the other side of the brain stem, uh, I'm sorry, other side of the midbrain, and then uh, descends in the lateral part of the brain stem tegmentum. Uh, this system, the rubrospinal tract, is the main route for mediating voluntary movement, mo moving distal extremities and fine motor control. And more specifically, it facilitates flexion uh, and inhibits extension uh, in the uh, upper ex extremities. So um, this little diagram of this person here is showing what is known as decorticate posturing that is sometimes seen following brain trauma or brain swelling. Um, and what is happening here is it's a facilitation of the rubrospinal tract, so it's producing this flexion of the upper extremities. So when the rubrospinal tract is active, it facilitates this flexion and the arms draw upward, as you see here. And uh, at the same time, it's disrupting the corticospinal tract um, which is associated with um, more of the lower extremity uh, extension. Um, this is a, a very bad sign, uh, suggests a serious problem, and uh, then, uh, the transition from uh, decorticate to decerebrate posturing, we'll see in a second, uh, is associated with a massive swelling of the brain that is often seen in uh, brain trauma. So in primates other than humans, uh, the rubrospinal tract can actually take over almost completely for the functions of the corticospinal tract if the corticospinal tract is lesioned. Um, but uh, that's not really the case with humans. The humans really need um, the uh, corticospinal tract to be intact for normal movement, although uh, again, uh, with no corticospinal tract, there could be some uh, rudimentary movements that are possible in the distal extremity. The uh, rubrospinal tract also sends projections to the cranial nuclei that control facial movements on either side. So again, it's uh, um, innervating more lateral musculature. Uh, the lateral system, uh, actually the components have fewer collaterals and they make connections with fewer spinal cord segments than fibers of the ventromedial system. Uh, the ventromedial system is very, very connected um, uh, with the spinal cord. This is, again, a diagram of the um, rubrospinal tract. In the rubrospinal tract, we see um, that uh, the, there's a crossing over sort of immediately from the red nucleus over to the other side, and then it descends down uh, the uh, lateral columns. The um, organization and the termination of the rubrospinal tract suggests that the function of this tract is to try to control independent movements of the distal musculature, such as arms, hands, feet, and legs. The tract also gives up collaterals to the sensory trigeminal nucleus and the face, again, which is what I just said, 
which in turn gives off collaterals to the dorsal column nuclei that uh, help re receive and relay proprioceptive input from the body. Um, there's also some evidence that uh, the rubrospinal tract has a modulatory action on sensory input from the body, so its function can uh, serve a sort of a modulatory uh, sensory function in addition to the motor function. I mentioned uh, the cerebral posturing, which is sort of the opposite here. With decorticate posturing, we saw the upper extremities drawn up and the lower extremities extended, feet turned in. Uh, the cerebral posturing, uh, the head and back are arched backwards. Uh, that uh, kind of uh, posturing is called obstis, uh, obstitonus. <laughs> um, the uh, arms are extended by the side instead of um, drawn up. And uh, the teeth are clenched. Um, it can actually be on one side if uh, only one of the two uh, motor tracks are involved. And uh, when this decerebrate posturing occurs, it indicates brainstem damage below the level of the red nucleus in the uh, brainstem. And it's associated with lesions like a tumor or a stroke or uh, pressure building up in the midbrain, compressing it, and uh, also cerebellar lesions can cause this decerebrate uh, posturing. The transition from decorticate to decerebrate posturing uh, is associated with herniation of the brain, which is um, really due to massive swelling of the brain that starts to push the brain through the floor of the skull, through the foramen magnum, uh, and that's, again, a very, very, very bad sign. Um, oftentimes, uh, treatment of that involves uh, a craniotomy, removing part of the skull to allow the brain not to be compressed. Um, and um, it's, a, it's quite a serious situation. Thomas? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, is that the protective mechanism, or is it just like a damage response, like the posturing? The posturing. Um, that's a good question. My sense is it's more of a damage response. Um, just due to the activation of one system versus the other system. Um, so uh, as the brain starts to herniate, it's, um, uh, you're getting less of uh, an activation of the rubrospinal tract and more of an activation of the lateral coracospinal tract. There's uh, some other interesting uh, motor phenomena that we sometimes see. Uh, one is called a fencing response. Uh, we s we s we'll uh, often see this in competitive um, uh, contact after s um, a sports concussion. Uh, you, I, I'm having been a neuropsychologist for the Atlanta Falcons and the Atlanta Thrashers hockey team. I watch players very closely when they get hit to see if they exhibit uh, signs like the fencing response. Um, this fencing response is associated with a large uh, amount of force that's applied to the brainstem. As I showed you in that MRI video, the brain does wiggle around a good bit in the, in the skull. <coughs> and uh, with a very rap uh, a rapid acceleration, deceleration maneuver, uh, it can pr uh, provide a very significant force to the brainstem. And uh, this is associated then with the extension of one arm out and a flexion up of the other for up to several seconds. We uh, actually can see this in uh, the concussion that Conan 